Oh, just terrible, terrible. Try again. Hello. Hello. Shalom. That kind of thing. Is that a work? Okay. I need to get a selfie. That's just. Uh, it's just. It's just. It's in the contract, right? I, I, I show up, I get a selfie, that's the deal, right? All right, all right, pretend like you're happy, just this once, okay? Just once, you say, open source. One, two, three, open source. Open source. Open source. Ah, it's okay, one guy. So we don't have a lot of time, we're gonna go through it. As a result, I encourage you, my friends, to take note of all the stuff on this slide. Here, you're gonna find the most important stuff. Here, you will find the Git repository, wherein I have all the code for tonight's activities, for tonight's uh, instruction. Find that code, take a photo of this repository, of this URL, for your own use, for your own reference, for later on, and um, follow along at your own leisure later on, okay? If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to help, I'm on the Twitters. How many of you are on Twitter? I'm just curious, Twitter. 2019 Twitter, Twitter. All right, the rest of you, what are you doing? Facebook. No way, Twitter. There's no developers on Facebook. Get on Twitter, that's where the community is. The people, the, it's the new IRC. It's a great place to be. It's where the developers that drive the open source are. So if you wanna be there, be there. Um, what about email? How many of you are using email? <laughs> Anybody, who uses email? Email. I don't, I'm not really a big email person. But if you have to reach out to me by email, then that's, that's okay, I'm okay with that. A um, Little bit about myself, my name is Josh Long, it's nice to meet you. I have training videos on Safari that you might like. These are all you can eat buffet style subscription for technical content, kind of like Netflix, but you, uh, but you don't get stupider, right? That's nice. Um, I have a book called Cloud Native Java that I wrote in 2017. This book is all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud using Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. And this book is something about which I am very proud. It took a long time to finish this book, but we did get the result out eventually. The book took a little longer than we thought it was going to take. We thought it would be very quick, just six months no problem, we'd finish the book very quickly uh, and we'd be done. But in point of fact, it took, it did take just a, just a little bit longer than we expected that it was going to take. Now, there's a lot of reasons why a book might be so delayed, a lot of reasons for such a delay. But, oh yeah. All right, good stuff. There's a lot of reasons for such a delay, but that said, um, uh, you know, we thought we would be able to get this done very quickly and I'm not blaming O'Reilly. I don't know what would lead you to jump to such an ill-advised conclusion. No, 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 no. There's a lot of reasons why such a book might be so delayed. And uh, you know, it wasn't that, I mean, it's just a little delay, you know, it's just a, uh, just a tiny uh, delay. It wasn't a big deal, really. I mean, we thought six months and it was just a, it was just a little bit, oh, all right, it's two years, okay? Two years longer than we expected, but that's for a good reason. There's a great reason. We deliberated, we debated, Back and forth, cantankerously, rancorously, we debated the animal on the cover. Now, anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it doesn't matter what's in the book itself. Nobody's ever read these books. What people care about is the animal. And so we eventually settled on what is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird with blue ears that is indigenous, or as we would say in English, native to the Indonesian Java Islands. It's a bird that is native to the Java Islands and birds fly, yes, through the clouds, yes, yes. So it's a bird that is native to Java that flies through the clouds. It's a cloud native Java, it's a, it's a cloud native Java bird. It's a, it's a bird, anyway, it'll come, give it time. So there's that. And of course I do a podcast, it's called A Beautiful Podcast, you can find it on uh, you know, iTunes and all the other places, Google Podcasts, etc. That's every Friday. I do a screencast every Wednesday. These are me at a keyboard for an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, looking at different parts of the ecosystem, and I just focus on one small thing that might be interesting to you. Uh, and I've got a new book called Reactive Spring, and that's not done yet. I'm working on it. Hopefully, it'll be done very soon because you can see we already have the cover. The rest should be easy. Um, the book is all about how to build applications that take advantage of Reactive Spring, of all the sort of primitives in the Reactive Spring ecosystem. And really, that's what we're gonna talk about today, is, is all of that. Reactive programming is a, uh, is a new solution for an old problem. Namely, it's, an, uh, it's a new solution for a problem that has always existed, 
but which has only become problematic enough for us to think about it. And we see this problem uh, more and more as people move to microservices, as they move to big data, as they move to IoT, increasingly large amounts of data being conducted over the network. The more data being conducted over the network, the more we see that the limitations of traditional input and output uh, are starting to th limit our ability to scale. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine you have a traditional web server from like 10 years ago, okay? An older web server. Uh, or in fact, imagine you are writing your very first web server using Java today. You have a Java Net server socket and the Java Net server socket is listening on port 8080. And as soon as server socket dot accept returns, a client has connected, right? You have a client that's connected to your port. But that's, it's in a, you're in a while loop. You're saying while server socket dot accept equals true, then do the body of the while loop. In the body of the while loop, you answer the response. You produce a response. So you're given the input stream from the client and you're given an output stream and your job is to take something and turn it into bytes that get sent on the output stream. Well, of course, in a servlet engine, the thing that produces those bytes is a servlet, right? So what do you do in the servlet? What do you do in the, you know, struts or spring or whatever servlet? You call other web services and you wait for the data to come back. You call your JDBC database and you wait for the data to come back. And so you do things that take time. Well, of course, you can't w waste all this time in the while loop because you have other users who are coming, right? You have more than one user at the same time. So what do you do? Well, you create a thread. You create a thread so that you can handle more users at the same time. But still, each thread is now taking however long it takes for you to do all that work, to talk to the database, to call the other web services. This time in that thread is expensive. And you can create more threads, but only to a, a point, right? There's, an absolute, there's not, there's not a, an absolute upper bound to how many threads you can have, but let's just say that threads are expensive on the JVM, all right? You can't easily create unlimited threads. Let's say you tried to create a thousand threads on the JVM. Has anybody tried that? How did it go? Didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Work it well. Do it well then. Yeah. Uh, whatever the number is, it's maybe two. What, what happens if you try 2,000? Yeah, that wouldn't be. Yeah. And it doesn't, you don't have to go very far for that number to become apparent, right? Um, uh, it, the, number, the, the number is depending on how much RAM you've got and your computer and all that stuff, but it's a very low number, is my point. And the reason that it's a low number is because threads are expensive. Threads are backed by operating system threads. Each thread carries one megabyte of, of stack of context with it. So each thread you create takes another megabyte of RAM. So a thousand threads, already one gig of RAM for nothing. All you've done is just store the bookkeeping required to, to manage that thread. And then what about scheduling? Can you actually do a thousand things at the same time on your computer? Truly concurrently? Unless you have a thousand cores, or a thousand CPUs, I guess, right? At some point, you're doing scheduling, right? At some point, you're just moving work back and forth from one CPU to another, and that's the scheduler. What scheduler is that? That's the operating system scheduler, right? So the cost of moving work back and forth from one thread to another means a call to the operating system scheduler and then back again. That's slow. So you're not really truly going to do a thousand things at the same time, even if you were okay with the price of creating a thousand threads. So the question is, how do we scale out and handle more users if this approach doesn't work? Or the clue. No? That's coming, yeah. That will be a thing in the future that I hope will solve some problems. That is a great idea. Project Loom brings coroutines. It brings, it brings uh, 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 cooperative multitasking to the JVM, which is a big deal, right? This is a, uh, a solution that I hope we'll see in the JDK in the near future. In the meantime, um, and it actually, even when this arrives, we still have another problem, which is how do we build systems that are stable? And we'll talk about that in a second. But how do we make more efficient use? Or sorry, how do we, how do we solve scaling out with these threads? Right? How do we how do we handle more users with a limited number of threads? Yeah, I think I it, hold up. Don't skip ahead. Yeah, and this was these are all rhetorical questions. I don't actually want answers. Um, <laughs> the, the first question is how do we how do we scale out? How do we handle more users right now? Right? We've got all this code assuming uh, assuming blocking I/O. We've got all this code that has existed 
up to date, and we want to be able to handle more users at the same time. How do we do that? Well, the, the good answer, an, an okay answer, not the best answer, but an okay answer for the last you know, several years, 10 years, has been you just add more app instances, right? You scale out by scaling out horizontally. And of course, if you've moved to microservices and you've learned about microservices, then you know that microservices are a architecture uh, design that allows you to build, hopefully, mostly stateless services. When you move to stateless services, you're, you're not keeping any state in the server. And so the cost of scaling out and creating new nodes is cheap because any node in the server or rotation can handle the request, right? There's no web server state that needs to be replicated to make it so that those requests are handled correctly. So these, this paradigm, this architecture, allows us to cheaply scale out horizontally. It is a way to solve the problem of handling more requests. I work for a cloud computing company. I love it when you buy more app instances, right? Love it. When you pay for more horizontal scale, life is good. But is that the only way to scale out? Is it the best way to scale out? Could we do more? And I would say that, I would say that scaling out horizontally is a good sort of middle ground answer. You can take existing code and pretty easily get it to scale out in this way without having to do some dramatic rewrites. Right? You don't have to rethink everything to make this approach work. And it, and it is fairly cheap with cloud computing platforms today. And yet, it's still not the best that we can do. There's still more speed that we could, we could eke out of our servers if we were, wanted to. And so the question is, how can we get more efficiency on a single computer? How can we handle more requests with the computing resources that we already have? And as somebody in the audience just volunteered, the answer there is asynchronous I.O., right? That is to say, what we need to do is to be more efficient with the threads that we've already got. We can't create more threads, but we can be more efficient with the threads that we have. So the question then is, how do we do that? Well, it's asynchronous I.O. If the work that you are doing is I.O. bound, if the work that you're doing is constrained by your ability to do more input and output, then asynchronous I.O. may offer a solution. So all those calls that I just described where you call another web service, where you talk to a JDBC database, those interactions are blocking. You sit there, you wait for the input stream to return new bytes, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait for the next byte to arrive. This is the default behavior of traditional synchronous and blocking I.O. When you send bytes out, you wait for the acknowledgement that it's been sent, and you're not able to move forward in the meantime. <laughs> the, this, the result is that even though there's nothing happening, there's no data being conducted over the network. You're still waiting there. Your, your thread is just going, okay, come on, hurry up. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got to go. Nothing is getting done, and yet you're waiting. So asynchronous I.O. changes that. In asynchronous I.O., uh, you say, I'm going to send data out, and I will wait for an acknowledgment asynchronously. I'll wait for an interrupt, basically, a callback. Same thing for the re re receiving of data. When I want data, I ask for the data, and it comes back eventually, asynchronously. In this world, I'm not blocking. I'm not sitting there on the thread. I can move from one while loop iteration to the next very, very quickly. And I'm asking, ultimately, I'm asking the operating system to manage all these file descriptors to tell me when there's data available. That gets turned into a callback. In this world, I can reuse threads very quickly because I'm not blocking. I'm never sitting there waiting for bytes, waiting for the output or the input of bytes. Now, this mechanism sounds great, right? When will it arrive? Well, obviously, it's here. That's the thing that's very frustrating about this discussion. It's actually been here for a long time. Your operating systems, all of, all of the major modern operating systems, even Windows, even Windows, support this, right? All of them, even Windows. I mean, Windows. <laughs> Windows, I can't even, oh. I guess I should make fun of Mac instead. Did you? Have you all updated your Mac so that I can't hit enter twice? Do you remember that? Last year there was a bug in Mac where you could go to a, an administrator login prompt and just hit enter twice and it would log you in. Adorable. So anyway, the point is, even Mac supports this, right? Um, this mechanism has been around in your operating systems for at least 20 years. At least. Even Java supports it. Right? It's in Java 1.4 or later. That when, who knows when Java 1.4 came out? 2002. Yeah, close. 
early 2000s. I remember because I was certified for Java 1.3 in, in 2001, and then very quickly after that, 2002, Java 1.4 came out, and I was like, oh, great. I'm certified. I'm a Sun certified Java programmer. It doesn't say which version, so now I can, <laughs> you know, great. Don't have to take that test. So like, and by the way, uh, PostScript, nobody has ever asked me if I'm a Sun certified Java programmer. Nobody cares. Zero people. So that was useless. Uh, anyway, <sighs> that's been in Java 1.4 forever. It's been in Java and uh, since then for you know for 17 years. So the question is, why aren't we all using this? Why aren't we all writing code that takes advantage of this? And the answer is because we don't write code using that low level of an abstraction for asynchronous I/O, but we also don't write code using Java input stream and output stream. In most of our daily work, we think about the problem at a higher level. We think about it in terms of the abstractions that allow us to write and solve business problems that then get mapped to this underlying I/O layer. And whatever that top level thing that you're using looks like, it has to map eventually to this low level I/O layer. And for the most part, most of us obviously have been very successful writing software that didn't need and didn't take advantage of this asynchronous I/O. Like I say, it's, it's, it, would be, it would be a lie to say that we cannot write good software uh, without asynchronous I.O. Obviously, we have. But as we move to this world of microservices, of network services, of uh, big data and IoT and sensor data and all these kinds of things, you'll see that there's more data being moved around. And here, we start to see the limitations. So the question is, what kind of types, what kind of abstractions do we need to be able to think about this low-level I.O.? Well, obviously, I don't want to write code. I don't want to write business services and data access logic and security in terms of file channels and you know channels at the low level of Java NIO. So we need some sort of type. We need some types that allow us to describe data that is latent, that, it, that might be asynchronous. We need types that allow us to describe data that might be unbounded or unlimited, right? All these things are not, you can't really get that effect using Java uh, collections, for example. Collections don't let us model unlimited data very well. They don't let us model uh, latent or asynchronous amounts of data. So we need some sort of type that allows us to model this kind of data. Several companies, several companies got together a few years ago, four or five years ago, and we created the Reactive Streams specification. The Reactive Streams specification provides four very simple types, and we're going to talk about those in a second, but these types allow us to describe uh, asynchronous, possibly latent, possibly unbounded data. Okay? They are like the asynchronous world. They are like the asynchronous versions of collections. Okay? They also have a few other things. I'm going to talk about what those are in a, in a moment. Those are a good start, but they're still not enough. Think of them as being like Java arrays. Right? We still don't have support for operators. How do you do things like filtering and transforming and, uh, and, and you know, mapping and flat mapping. How do you do things like that? that that's not supported. I, want, I don't want Java arrays. I want Java streams, you know, but, but asynchronous and reactive. So we're missing that. And then even once we have those higher level things, we still need support at the layers above it, don't we? Right? Imagine for an instant, imagine just, hypo, just a, a hypothetical, okay? Imagine that for whatever reason, for reasons that I don't know, Imagine that Spring and Hibernate and all these other tools with which you are no doubt familiar, imagine that these tools did not like Java Util Set and Java Util List, these very basic types from the JDK that we've all no doubt employed in our services and our code. Imagine for whatever reason that whenever you used a Java Util List in your Hibernate mapping, that Hibernate didn't just throw an exception, right? Imagine it really hated these types. Really hated Java Util List. Imagine it didn't just throw an exception. It actually rendered an ASCII art middle finger <laughs> and then seg faulted the machine. Kernel panicked your machine somehow, right? It really hates Java collections. It's trying to tell you, don't ever do that again, ever, or your machine dies, right? Would you, would you continue to use Java Util List and Java Util Set if that's the abuse you knew that you could expect? No, right? You're not going to give up on Hibernate. Hibernate's the best there is at what it does, right? If you want to do 
uh, ORM type, type stuff for JDBC, Hibernate's very good. You're not gonna give that up because it solves the problem very well and you still have to deliver software. You still have to deliver value to the business. So you're gonna use the tool that offers the most features and you're just gonna use the path of least resistance, whatever that is. Maybe they've got some other type that they recommend that in, instead of util list and whatever. So you would use whatever is a recommended path of least resistance. Same thing for Spring. Imagine Spring wasn't friendly to these types. So since we know that the choice at the top levels influences what we can do at the bottom, it's important that whatever, we, whatever types we settle upon, whatever technologies we settle upon, support these reactive stream types. So here's where the journey for the Spring team took its first major step. In 2017, in September, we released Spring Framework 5. Spring Framework 5 uh, assumes a Java 8 baseline. And from there, we released Spring Data K, Spring Security 5, Spring Boot 2.0, and Spring Cloud Finchley, all in the next eight months. From there, we had the ability to build end-to-end -end reactive microservices. And we've done a, a lot of cool stuff since then as well. So what we're gonna talk about today, my friends, is how to use all these pieces to build reactive services. We're gonna take a look at, you know, we're gonna start small and then scale up as we go. So those are my slides, I hope you like them, what did you think? So we're gonna build some new software, I hope you like my slides, like I said. We're gonna build some software here uh, at, my, at the second, my second favorite place on the internet, after production. My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. It's, the weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. But if you've never been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start. That's spring. <laughs> that I owe. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start. That's spring. That I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion, after a long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, <laughs> start. That's spring. That I owe. So we're gonna build a new piece of software here called the reservation hyphen service. We're gonna use Spring's reactive web support, Lumbuck, and we're gonna use a persistence option. I'm gonna choose reactive MongoDB, but we also have reactive Cassandra, reactive Couchbase, and reactive Redis. And we're gonna actually look at reactive Redis in a little bit, but for now, I'm happy with our choices. Uh, and I'm gonna hit generate. That's gonna, oh, wait, 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 actually, I wanna choose the new version here. Uh, 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 uh. Goodbye. We're gonna choose the latest and greatest because I can. I'm gonna hit generate, and that'll give me a zip file that I'm gonna open up in my IDE. It doesn't all that much matter which IDE you use. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a matter of, you know, what your preference is. Anything that supports Java 8 or better will work just fine, okay? So Java 8 or better. I'm using IntelliJ, you can use uh, Eclipse, you can use NetBeans, you can use uh, anything you want, you know? Visual Studio Code is a nice choice. Really, lots of good choices. All right, so we have a brand new public static void main entry point into Spring Boot. I'm not gonna spend too long introducing Spring Boot, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build an application that saves data in MongoDB. And so MongoDB is running it on my local machine in the background here. And I'm gonna create a object that's gonna be mapped to MongoDB. It's gonna be a document that's a single record inside of a collection. In MongoDB, a collection is like a table, a document is like a single row in that table. And we're going to create records uh, that um, that, uh, that have an ID, right, so at ID, and we're gonna create records that are, uh, that have getters and setters, you know, I want getters and setters and two string and all that stuff, so I could do all this, I could just, you know, code generate my way to, to all the uh, stuff that I need here, right, like this, but that's terrible, I mean, look at all that waste. So instead of doing all that, I tend to use Lumbach, right? Lumbach is a compile time code uh, generator, it's an annotation processor that gets evaluated at compile time, and now I've got an entity that I'm gonna to use to persist records to the database, but I need a uh, repository. And so Spring Data provides us this thing called a, uh, a, a, repo a repository uh, that is based on an interface. So we have this interface that is coming with Spring Data. It's a reactive create, read, update, delete repository, okay? This repository provides all the useful methods that we need to support reading, writing, updating, and deleting. 
We don't have to provide an implementation of this interface. Spring Data will do that for us. It'll provide a thing that already has support for all these different methods. And you can see here, there's a lot of very convenient methods like save, save all, find by ID, flush, uh, find all, find by ID, count, delete, etc. All these very useful things. These methods should seem very familiar, but some things are very different. First of all, notice that we have a publisher here. This publisher is a type of reactive stream publisher. So org, reactive streams, publisher. A publisher publishes data. It emits items of type T. T, in this case, could be a string, could be a byte, it could be a byte buffer, it could be a customer record, it could be a product or an order, it could be whatever you want. It's just a stream of type T. And so publishers emit items of type T. They emit these items of type T to the subscriber. The subscriber has a callback on next that gets called whenever a new item of type T is consumed. If there are any errors, those errors are treated as just another kind of data. You see, in the reactive world, errors are not exceptional. Right? We don't have a separate control flow mechanism here. You handle errors in the same way that you handle any other kind of data. And then finally, we have on complete, which gets called whenever processing has completed normally without error. Okay? Now I skipped over this most important of methods, on subscribe. Think about what we're doing here. We're using asynchronous I.O. We're inverting the normal way that we deal with input and output. Instead of pulling data from an input stream, we are now having the thing that has the data push the data to us. So we're not pulling, we're not asking for the data. It's giving it to us when it has it. And so the normal interaction is different. It's uh, turned inside out. And so we are in a, in a different position. We no longer have direct control over the rate of consumption. We are no longer uh, the ones who are dictating the speed at which we consume the data. And that's a dangerous position to be in. It creates unstable systems. So what we need is some way to say, look, I can't handle any more data. Please slow down. That's what this subscription does. This subscription is given to us the very first thing that happens right after the subscriber subscribes to the publisher. We're given the subscription, and the subscription has a method here called request. Request is used to ask for more records of type T. I want to request 10 more records, or 1,000, or whatever. And if I want all the records as fast as possible, I only need to provide long.maxValue. That, that means effectively unbounded, unlimited. Okay? But otherwise, if I request 10 records, then I will get no more than 10 records. I might get 10 records in one nanosecond. I might get 10 records in one year, right? But the point is I won't get more than that. If I want more, I have to request 10 more or 1,000 more or whatever, okay? I said that the reactive stream specification has four types, and yet I've only shown you three. The fourth one is very simple. It's called processor. It's a source and a sync. All right, so producer uh, and processor and subscriber, very, very simple, okay? Um, I just noticed that I forgot something very important here. I forgot to do this, switch to the full version, choose Java 11. Oh, I'm so sad. Goodbye. Goodbye. Java 11 is the only correct choice. All right, so take two, this time with Java 11. So interface, reservation, oh wait, no, class, reservation, private string, ID. Eight, eight or 11. Did I choose 11? Yeah. I want 11. Yeah, Java 11. It says right there. <laughs> All right, good. I, ID, <coughs> document, data, all args, no args. Okay, interface, reservation repository. Extends reactive CRUD repository reservation type string. Okay, so there's my new, there's the same thing as we had before. Now I said that we have support here for publishers, right? And I explained how these are all part of the reactive stream specification. <coughs> you may not recognize some of these other types either. Mono is a publisher as well. Mono, here it is, is a publisher from our project from Pivotal called Reactor. So Reactor builds on the reactive stream specification. A mono is a publisher that publishes zero or one value. It's like a completable future that supports 
the, the ability to request more data. That ability, by the way, that thing I just described where we have subscription, we, which we can use to request more data, supports flow control, right? We're pushing, we're telling the producer, I can't handle more records than this. Please don't give me any more data. That's called flow control. It's very important in building distributed systems. And if you've ever had to build your own network protocol, you have to think about flow control. In the world of reactive programming, where marketing has prevailed, that flow control has been renamed back pressure. Okay? So if you see the word back pressure, just think marketing word for an idea that's been around for 50 years. Very simple idea. I want to ensure stable systems. So a mono is kind of like a completable future, except that it supports back pressure and it's asynchronous. Okay? Well, it's a completable future is asynchronous, but it's, it's got back pressure. On the other hand, a flux, a flux is a publisher that produces zero or one, zero to n records, right? Zero to potentially unlimited. So it's like a, a collection. It's like a, a, a collection that is asynchronous and supports back pressure. So that's it. That's, these are the, these are the uh, two types from Reactor. And this repository will be turned into an object that we can inject automatically. So now let's create a initializer. Okay, it's going to be a bean that listens for an event. Ready event dot class public void go, uh, and we're going to say at component. I'm going to inject the reservation repository here, and I'm going to inject it into the constructor. And the reason I use it, I, the reason I'm going to inject it into the constructor is because every time you do field injection, a unit test dies. <laughs> every time. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a publisher. This is going to create a publisher of names. My name is Josh. It's nice to meet you. Let's go get some names. What's your name, my friend? Hi. Yeah. How do you spell that? M-I-C-A-J-L. Like that? Yeah. Very cool. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? Hi. How do you spell it, my friend? H-A-I-M. H-A-I-M? Like this? Yes. Cool. Does that mean, like, does that mean life? Ah, like the Heim. Okay, that's cool. I knew that one. Cool. Um, uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? Brad. How do you spell it, buddy? Aurian. Like this? Exactly. Very cool. Nice to meet you, buddy. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Eddie. E D D Y. Like that? Thanks. Nice to meet you, buddy. So there's our names. This is actually a publisher, right? It's a publisher of string names, right? I'm just going to store it as this though, because YOLO. Now, I've got the names, and what I want to do is I want to map each one. I'm going to turn each one into a reservation, passing in that, and that'll give me a publisher of reservations, right? So there's that, and now I want to visit each one of those, and I want to take the, the reservation that I have, and I'm going to write it to the database. So R, and I'll say this dot reservation repository at save, passing in R. Now, what is save return? Save returns a mono, and map creates a publisher of publishers, or map creates a publisher of the return value, and the return value is a mono of reservation. I don't want that, right? So I use flat map, and so that gets me the intermediate publisher, right? So now that you understand what that is, let's just clean it up a little bit, Java 11, okay? Use a ref reference there. Now, what happens if I run this code right now? Exactly. Somebody said nothing. Exactly. I have to subscribe. Okay? So I can subscribe like this. If I hit subscribe, it'll actually execute the pipeline. What I have defined here is a pipeline. Now, keep in mind, these things don't have to be three separate variables. They can just be one thing like this. Right? There you go. That's the same code, uh, except now I have to say names. Right? Now, of course, I'm, I'm confronted with another problem here, which is, I want to delete everything in the database before I run this code. So I could say reservation repository de delete all, but that gives me a mono of void. So I need to subscribe to that. But this gives me another problem, which is there's no guarantee that this will complete executing before this. Subscribe is asynchronous. So I want to force this to execute before all of this. I could, I could, if I wanted to, I could say dot block. <laughs> right? That, this kind of code makes me want to take a shower. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Instead, 
what I want to do is I want to compose the publisher with the other one. So I'm going to take this and compose it. So here we are, names. And then I'm going to say this.reservationRepository.findAll. And then I'm going to say that I want to log out the results. So I'm going to pass in a consumer and log out the result like that. Now, of course, this can be written as lambda, like so. And that can be a method reference, like so. And there we are. There's my uh, output and so on. So let's run it and see what we get. Good stuff. All right, so there's our data. There we are, all, all eight of us. We happy few. It worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. <laughs> what were you expecting? That was always going to work. That was not why we're here. What I really wanted to talk about is this. This is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. This artwork took a long time to get right, but we have people on the Spring team who are doctors, PhDs, people who in their previous lives worked in nuclear physics, star stuff, the very celestial bodies in the heavens above us were their daily bread and butter. So it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue that said, darn it, we need good ASCII artwork. <laughs> and I think you can agree they did a great job. So it's for this reason that I want to take a brief moment, a very brief moment, to talk about what I consider to be a glaring and serious deficiency in the IntelliJ JetBrains product. Because even though I'm a fan, I consider this to be a particularly short-sighted and deficient feature. Do you see this checkbox? This one? This one right here? Do you see it? Do you, do you see it right here? This one. Got, do you see it? That one? Right there. This one. This one. This checkbox, once you click it, suppresses the output of the ASCII artwork. What the hell? Why is this even here? What a stupid feature. Nobody even asked you, IntelliJ, okay? Nobody even asked you. So I did what all people would do in the same situation. I'm not a hero, you don't have to thank me. I went on the internet and I cried and I was given a message of hope from my friend, Jan Sabron. This is Jan Sabron right here. This is, this is Jan Sabron. <laughs> Boop. He sent me this message of hope which I wanna share with you here today. He's a softer developer by passion at JetBrains. <laughs> and he sent this message of hope which I share with you here today. You know, that it fills me with hope and optimism and, and encourages me. And I want to believe that it's going to be okay, you know. He keeps telling me, Josh, don't worry. It's going to be okay, Josh. There is going to be a fix as soon as possible. It'll be in the next release. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine, you know. And I, I want to believe him. He's a friend, after all. I want to believe that he's telling me the truth, you know. But uh, uh, he, he keeps telling me, just don't worry. It'll be in the next release. I'm sure of it, right? He keeps telling me. And you know what? I'm starting to have trouble believing that he's on the level. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but, but I'm starting to think maybe, just maybe, he's not telling me the truth. Anyway... Whatever, we've got amazing ASCII artwork in the, in the application. We've got data in the database. Now we are confronted with another problem. I want to build an API to talk to that database, right? I want to build an API, a REST API. So one way to do this is to create a Spring MVC style REST controller like this. And here, just very simple, reservation REST controller, private final reservation repository, right? Add the constructor, create an endpoint, forward slash reservations, and publisher of reservation. Whoa. Return this dot reservation repository to find all. Okay, so there's my Spring MVC style reservation endpoint. And I can go to my browser here and hit that endpoint. So there's my data, right? There's my endpoint. And that's the data that I just created that got returned. Uh, oops, Gil, there we go. Uh, from my endpoint. Okay, so it's all there, right? Now I've got a REST API. I like this style. I like what I just showed you. I like Spring MVC style endpoints here. Uh, but keep in mind, this is not Spring MVC. It might seem very familiar. It has the same annotations and so on. It has the same controller types and you have an object that has a constructor, uh, etc. But this isn't Spring MVC. In fact, there's not even a servlet API here. 
This is a brand new reactive web runtime based on Netty called Spring Web Flux, right? Netty. Am I having a stroke? <laughs> Do you hear that? Yeah. Did it disappear for you too, or is it gone? <laughs> Awkward. Anyway, it's a brand new reactive web runtime called Spring Web Flux, and it is not the same thing. In Spring Web Flux, everything is asynchronous by default, not synchronous. And so if you are confused about how to proceed, the answer is just create a publisher. You want to do WebSockets? Create a publisher. Want to send back eight records in JSON? Just create a publisher. Want to do server send events? You create a publisher. It's just very simple. Life becomes very simple now that you have one overarching guiding principle. So let's say I want to create an endpoint that serves server send events. Okay? This is a, just a type of data that's streamed from the browser to the client. It's great for things that are long lived and that uh, you want the client to consume continuously. So I'm going to say flux.fromstream, stream.generate, new supplier, and I'm going to return a new value. I'll say hello, wait, is it shalom? Is that right? <laughs> At instant.now, okay? And I want to delay each element by one second, okay? So there's my updated code, okay? And I'm just creating a very simple stream it's going to produce a new value every second for infinity. Okay, let's restart. Oh. Okay. So curl, HTTP, or better yet here, SSE. So you can see it's returning a new value every second. It's incrementing that value every second. It's calling the su supplier every second. And it's going to continue to do that forever and ever and ever. It has no end. It is endless. It's infinite. It goes on without end forever and ever and ever. Endless. Like the oceans and the stars and the seas and the skies and the bugs in your code. Just infinite. Infinite. So whatever you do, my friends, whatever you do, and I cannot stress this enough. Whatever you do, do not curl this endpoint. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I have continuously updating values, but in between the raindrops, in between each emitted item, the thread on the server is being reused for other things. It's not blocking. I'm not sitting there waiting for it to produce stuff. So it's very easy to create a code that has time as a dimension, right? It's not just data or the length of the data, but also when the data happens. That's a dimension of the API when you build reactive code. This is, you know, this is pretty clear up here. If you look at what I did here, I deleted all the data, and then asynchronously and concurrently, I then saved the data afterwards. So this happens first, then this, sorry, then this, then this, and then finally, as the results come back, I log out the results. This is complicated kind of workflow code, right? I'm, I'm doing something, I'm saying, Delete everything first on one thread, could be multiple threads, and then save everything, potentially on different threads, and then finally find all the data, right? Imagine doing, the, imagine doing you know, code with countdown latches and cyclic barriers and whatever else you needed to make that kind of workflow code work otherwise. Very complex kind of stuff, and yet it's just getting done for you automatically. There is a scheduler behind the scenes here. You can override the scheduler, right? You can say that I want this code, this pipeline, to execute within a certain, what in that? Uh, within a certain thread pool, for example, executors, etc. right? Executors dot fix thread pool, okay? So I can actually execute here uh, on, a on a separate thread pool. I can control how these, this pipeline of code executes. You know, no problem, right? I can do that, um, but but um, you shouldn't need to do that. If you're using reactive APIs, it's not going to block. So each each thread becomes an event loop. You're just going to constantly take data, you know, kick off the pipeline, and then move on to the next thread. It'll do it just fine. But if you have something that is blocking that needs to interact with a blocking uh, source of data, 
then you can, only ex you can only scale out that interaction by adding more threads. This is why it's useful to know how to do this. By default, you'll have a scheduler that has one thread per core. That should be enough. It's just good to know. It's con considered a code smell if you have to use a custom scheduler. Something is weird. Okay, so now uh, we have service and events. We've got regular data. Uh, and I did all this to demonstrate that time is a thing that you can control, you can think about. I can easily delay the data, for example, by one second. That's possible because behind the scenes, Reactor and the reactive runtime has given me uh, a scheduler. Now, I like this style, but this is not the only way to build REST endpoints or HTTP endpoints in Spring Framework 5. We have introduced a new component model here called Spring, or sorry, called Functional Reactive Endpoints. And so the way this works is you uh, use the DSL to describe how you want to match incoming requests. So for example, I want to match reservations. And then you provide a handler function that gets invoked in response to the incoming request. So I'm going to inject the reservation repository here. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm creating a publisher that's going to produce results whenever a new re request comes in. I'm going to clean this up using Java 8 uh, lambdas and Java 5 static imports. Uh, and you can see that when I do that, the code becomes very clean. Right? It's much cleaner than, than having a whole class. Now, again, if you have a bunch of endpoints that are related to each other, one does get, one does delete, one does put and post, then having those different endpoints in the same, con in the same controller makes a lot of sense. In that case, it's not such a big deal. But in this case, all I wanted to do is have an HTTP get endpoint that returns this data. But then I had a constructor and a field and a class and a, you know, all that other stuff just to support that endpoint. With this style, I don't have to do that. Now, keep in mind, this is functional reactive endpoints. But you can also use the Spring MVC style controller styles as well. You can, you can mix and match them. You can have them together in the same application. There are some disadvantages to, and advantages to both. One thing that I like about this style is that it's a builder model. So I can actually say, okay, well, I'm going to add endpoints based on some condition. And route, you know, post equals foo new handler function, for example. Okay. So you can do that kind of thing very easily based on this dynamic registration model. I can actually, based on a for loop or a condition, I can register another handler endpoint. The other thing that's nice is that this request predicate is not an annotation. It's actually a strategy interface that you can override. So I can say, I want to create my own request predicate where I say return math.random is greater than 0.5. So here, I'm actually creating a my RP, right? And I can use that instead of the, the built-in one. I can say, okay, match all HTTP GET requests and match um, is it you know greater than 0.5, right? I can do this very easily uh, because I can compose these things together. Maybe it's even better just to do this. There you go. So now uh, GET. Okay, so I can create custom request predicates there. This is a DSL that's saying call HTTP, you know re match HTTP GET requests for forward slash reservations. I can use the DSL, but because it's just an interface, just an object, I can override that and so on. So when do you use which? Well, again, it's up to, it's up to style, what, it's up to taste. One thing I like about this style is that I can have all of the routing logic, all the route routing request predicates in the same code page, and then have the handlers spread across different classes. So now if I want to refactor a URL strategy or a URL, called, URL hierarchy, I can do that in one page. Whereas before with Spring MVC style endpoints here, the routing information is next to the handler logic. And you might have handlers in different code pages and different classes and different modules and so on. So it's hard to find all the different routes in the application. But again, your mileage may vary. Now, let's take a moment and clean this up a little bit. I've got this Spring MVC style controller. I'm going to get rid of that. This is an initializer. It's, it's good for our demo so that we have some sample data. But realistically, we don't need it, right? That's not going to be in a real application. So here is what the production code looks like if you get rid of all the stuff that isn't real, okay? So I've got a function reactive REST API, a repository, and our entity. That's all the code that I really wrote that is actually useful today, right? Not a lot, okay? I'm gonna return that so we have some sample data, very good, but that other stuff was all we needed for the production application. So now I've got an application that's up and running. I'm gonna go ahead and build a client and this client is going to be an edge service. So I'm going to use the Reactive Web Support Lumbuck. I'm going to use the Hystrix Circuit Breaker. I'm going to use Spring Cloud Gateway. I'm going to use uh, Reactive Redis. And I'm going to use Reactive Spring Security. And I'm going to use the latest and greatest version of Spring Boot. Just because. Oh, I forgot. Okay. 
So close. Trying to use Java 11 more. It's nice. Very nice. Okay, Java 11. Thank you. Generate UAO reservation client. Now, I'm building a client that will talk to our service. This client <clears throat> is an edge service. It's the first port of call. It's the, it, it handles requests that come in from the outside, from the random client, so that we can, we can adopt outside clients like our iPhones, our Playstations, our Xboxes, our Rokus, our HTML5 browser devices, that one person using Windows Mobile, all these different clients get passed through the edge service and then get adapted to the downstream services. So imagine I want to add a new HTML5 browser client to my ensemble and I want to support that HTML5 browser based client but in order to do that I need to have uh, cross origin request scripting headers. Right? I, I have to worry about uh, serving data from a different host and port than the JavaScript HTML5 application. I can't make a, an Ajax call from one node to another on a different host and port unless I have a header in the service to which I'm making that request that allows the client to make that request. Right? It's called access control allow origin. Well, I don't want to change every single microservice. I don't want to change all of my microservices uh, just to support that new header. So instead of doing that, I'm going to use Spring Cloud Gateway. Spring Cloud Gateway is just that. It's an API technology that allows you to build APIs uh, that support uh, gateway-like functionality. I think of it as being uh, more powerful than, for example, Nginx and Mod Rewrite and Kong, but less powerful than something more full-featured full like Apogee. Right? I think it's kind of in the middle there. It's a, your mileage may vary, and uh, I, I would encourage you to start with this and see if it works. And if it does, great, you're done. Right? The, the basic structure is that you just return a bean of type route locator. A route locator is just an interface that requires a publisher of routes. And you can derive these routes from anything. These routes can be created by config files. They can be created by data that you store in MongoDB of your own sort of uh, de de device, you know, whatever you want. But in this case, I'm going to use the Java DSL to build up a few in-memory routes here. Now you can see I can chain these together. I can build as many as I want. But for our purposes, I'm just going to build one route. So this is the route config. And here I'm going to configure how I want to match incoming requests. So I'm going to say that anything that goes to spring.il will match this host and this path called proxy. Okay. Uh, now I want to send this to localhost 8080 forward slash. Well, I want to send it to that host, right? But if I send it to that host, it's going to be at localhost 8080 forward slash proxy because it matched this request. And then it's taking the entire request and sending it to this without changing it. Well, for the request that's coming in, it's obviously to forward slash proxy, but forward slash proxy doesn't exist, right? We know that forward slash reservations exists, so I need to use a filter to change the incoming request. And so one filter that I'm going to use is set path. I'm going to change the path from proxy to reservations, all right? So there we go. There's my, my call. Now, this service, this edge service, is going to live on a different port, 9999. So let's restart this and see what we get. Uh, and actually, before I restart it, let's do this. Let's also add that response header. So there we are. There's my custom response header. OK, so now curl minus h host uh, Spring.il, so foo.spring.il, uh, HTTP, localhost, 9999, forward slash proxy. Okay, and there's our data. Okay, so I'm making a proxy request to the downstream microservice. And I'm getting the JSON back, just as we, as we expected it to. So here's Ron and Josh and all these other names, okay? That's great. And obviously, I should, just, I should use HTTP or JQ, but there you go. Okay, so that's working. Now... What if I had a downstream service? What if there was a service downstream of my edge service, of my gateway, that was slow, or that couldn't handle the load, or that had to have a limited number of re users that accessed it, right? One way to solve this is use a rate limiter. So here's a rate limiter, okay? I'm gonna use a rate limiter to limit how many requests I allow to the downstream service. Rate limiters keep a track, they keep count of how many requests have gone through, and if the number of requests exceeds the budget, that you've prescribed, then we reject the requests. So I'm going to keep that count of how many requests have gone through for a given path. 
I'm going to keep that count in Redis. Redis is a distributed data structure server that's running on my local machine, just like MongoDB was running on my local machine. So I'm going to use a Redis backed rate limiter. And this rate limiter is going to satisfy, it'll handle five requests per second and burst to seven requests. Okay. So I'm saying use this rate limiter based on Redis. Now, like I say, Redis is a key value store. So you need to give it a key so that it can find the value, which is the count that it is keeping for the number of requests per second. Okay, every second, it's going to keep an atomic number in Redis. And all the gateway clients are going to talk to the same Redis store. And they'll see that if you accessed this pathway, no matter what node you're talking to, five times per second, it should stop, it should start rejecting the requests. Okay, so I need to tell it what key to use to find that number, that count. And I could just return a hard coded number, my key, right, or mono dot, like so, mono dot just. I could do that, right? That's easy enough. Clean that up a little bit, becomes very easy to look at, right? Um, uh, that's, that would give me this, that would mean that all users in the whole world, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, would have access to the request only five times. They could make, f only five people or five clients could make requests in the whole world. That's not really a great use case. That's not really a very common example, right? Unless you have like a mainframe. Like if you're calling, a, if you're calling, uh, this edge service and this edge service is going to send a request to uh, a mainframe. Mainframes are notoriously hard to scale. They handle, you know, a fixed number of transactions per second. And if you want to add one more transaction, you need another mainframe, right? So that's not good. It's very, it's very, it's very cost effective to serialize requests going to a mainframe instead of trying to add more mainframes. Um, so that might be that use case. But what if I want to instead? What if I want to say, I want to have five requests per user in the system. So now I'm not saying five requests total for the whole world. I'm saying each user can have five requests because I can always add more nodes, right? I can auto scale up. Cloud Foundry will support auto scaling, for example, right? Cloud platforms will support auto scaling. So instead here, what I wanna do is I wanna say, look at the current authenticated user in the request. And if there is an authenticated user, and we'll talk about we will talk about how that authenticated user gets added in just a second. But if there is an authenticated user, then use the printable name, right? Get name and use that as the key. So that, that could work. Now, what if there is no uh, printable? In this case, I want to return an empty publisher. So let's clean this up a little bit. There we go. So that's a very, that's a fairly common strategy, right? Now I'm saying each user can access the website five times per second. This ensures that you have a font, you have a, an honest user, an honest game, right? Users are playing an honest game. You're not uh, overwhelming the system or, or submitting fraudulent charges or whatever. You know, most of your users aren't going to click on the website five times per second, right? That's not, that's not normal. So this is probably okay. Um, you can clean this up, right? You can, you can get rid of the extra curly brackets and that's fairly common, very easy to look at, right? Clean code. This is actually a very common strategy here, what I just showed you. Limiting it based on the number of users, uh, based on the number of requests per user, is a very common strategy. So there's actually a, a pre-written one called Principal Keyname Resolver that you can use that comes for you that does exactly the same thing. Actually, it's so common that that is the default. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove it. <laughs> We're back to where we started. Uh, so good stuff. Now, in order for this to work, <clears throat> in order for that to work, we need to have security, right? I did say that we have a Java security principle. Well, we need to bring in Spring Security and configure that so that we can do uh, authentication uh, and authorization, right? Authentication is the question, who is making the request? What, what is the name of the user, right? So I'm going to answer that question here with a, a, an in-memory database of users, right? So I'll say var jlong equals users dot with default password encoder dot username equals jlong password pw roles user dot build okay and i'll add another user here for rob winch he's the lead of spring security who with whom i trust my life and my data implicitly so r winch okay so r winch j long so i've got a hard coded list of usernames and passwords there that's authentication and i'm going to also address authorization what can they do once they're inside the system? What endpoints can they access once they're inside the, the, the house, so to speak? Like if, they, if I let somebody into the house, 
uh, I want to limit what doors they can open, right? That's authorization. So here we go. I'm going to say match proxy and require that to be authenticated. Anything else, I'll just allow it to go through unchanged, okay? So now we've got authentication and authorization. This is for Spring Security. Um, and a couple things come to mind. First of all, most, <clears throat> most of the time, you shouldn't be doing, uh, well, first of all, you should definitely not be doing hard-coded usernames and passwords. Second of all, when you do password encoding, think about what's happening, right? When you match a request that comes in, what happens when, uh, what happens when um, a request comes in from the client that has a username and password in the request? You have a password in the request, you want to compare this password to some password that you have in your in your users table, right? Well, are you storing your users' passwords unencoded in the database? I hope not, right? You can do better than that, Sony, right? <laughs> so we need to make sure that we store our passwords encoded in the database, which means that in order for us to match this password, <coughs> Spring Security needs to encode the password that's sent in the request, and then use that to match against the encoded passwords in the database. Okay, well, what happens when you do a password encoding? You're doing something like, you're doing some sort of cryptography, some sort of algorithm, right? So you might be using bcrypt, for example. bcrypt is the default configuration for Spring Security. bcrypt is a computationally inefficient algorithm, right? It is designed to take time. If you want a strong encoding, then it takes longer than if you want a weak one. That's a feature, not a bug, right? And where does it take time? Where does it spend that time? On the CPU, on a thread, right? So it's gonna block a thread and there's nothing you can do with Reactive to fix it. You can't rub Reactive on it to make it better. Password encoding is one of those things like Fibonacci and Bitcoin mining and all sorts of other kinds of cryptography that will take time and block threads. And so it's, it's in your best interest to find ways to do this password encoding as infrequently as possible, as rarely as possible. One way to do that is to exchange username and passwords, which are long-term credentials, for short-term credentials. So you can use OAuth, for example, right? Spring Security supports a reactive OAuth. So what you do is you take username and password, you exchange it for a token, and that token is very easy to, to, to redeem all over the API, right? You can validate that without having to do bcrypt encoding. Uh, you can go one step further by using something like Okta. Okta is a hosted in the cloud identity provider. And they do, they do OAuth as well. They're still, you know, they still have to do the password encoding and decoding, but that's their problem. You pay them <clears throat> and then they spend their computers doing that, right? Your, your servers are, are free to be, you know, as non-blocking as possible. So there's, a, there's actually a good discussion to be had about performance and security here. It's a win-win by using things like OAuth. Anyway, we have uh, our security in integrated into the application. Let's go ahead and uh, restart and see the application. I'm going to do minus V. And when I do minus V, it says 401 unauthorized. Okay. Now, minus U, J long, PW. And when I do that, I get... Whoop, I get back my JSON, and I also get back my access control allow origin header, and I get back my rate limited capacity. It tells me I've made this many requests per second. I have this much free requests that I can still make. Okay. Now let's try. Let's drive this in a while loop. While true, do, and done. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna just. I set it to five requests. That's a very low number, and the reason is because I'm using Bash. I'm using Bash to try and overwhelm the service, which is. You know, bash is not very fast, right? So I set it to five so it could so I could see it. So here we go. That's okay. 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 Too uh, too many requests. Four two nine. Here the rate limiter is, is protecting the downstream service, right? So now we, we, at some point, we exceeded five requests per second and those requests were rejected for us. Great, okay, great. 
Now, this is a gateway. Gateway is great for cross-cutting kinds of concerns, things that are generic, things that don't require specific knowledge of the downstream service, right? Sometimes, however, you might have APIs that you want to transform, that you want to change, or maybe you want to synthesize a new endpoint. So I want to call service A and service B and create a new endpoint called service C. This is called an API adapter. It's not the same thing as an API gateway. Um, and we can, do, we can create API adapters very easily using Spring WebFlux. So router function, server response. I'm going to create a new endpoint here. Okay, a new endpoint that returns just the uh, names for the reservations. So reservations, forward slash names, new handler function, etc. Okay. Now this names endpoint is going to require a call to the reservation service. So I'm going to create a reactive microservice client called reservation client. It's going to return a publisher of reservation. Now I don't have the type reservation on the class path. So I'm going to do something terrible, something that you should never ever do, ever. Not even when you're all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I'm going to copy and paste code. Here we go. <laughs> paste. Final reservation. Uh, in order to make this call, I'll use this. And I'll say webclient.get.uri localhost. 8080. So I'm, I'm using the reactive web client here to make that call. And when the data comes back, I'm going to turn it into a reservation. Okay, so there's my new spring bean. It's just a regular spring bean. I'm going to make it a that component. I'm going to inject that into my reservation gateway here, my reservation API gateway and adapter. So reservation client, like so. Now, Look at that code. I'm going to say client dot get all reservations dot map get name. And that's going to give me a publisher of strings, right? Var names. Now let's clean this up a little bit. Let's uh, flesh this out. So server response dot okay dot body names string dot class. All right, that's good. Now what about this? Add static import, replace it with a lambda. Great. Okay. So now let's just restart this code and see what that does for us. Does it work? I hope it does. And I'll clean this up again. Uh, here we go. Reservations. Curl. Localhost. 9999 forward slash reservations forward slash names. Okay. So uh, that didn't work. Oh, thank you. No, that's right. 9999 localhost. What did I do? Reservations names. Oh, right. No, that's it's wide open, right? It says any exchange should be allowed to go through. Sorry? Always Restarting is a great idea. When in doubt, kick it. Sorry? I didn't hear you. Any exchange? Yeah, that should be fine. Path matches proxy authenticated. Oh, router function routes. Oh, gateway. Let's try that. Request, server response, names. It's always something. Ooh, that looks different. Internal server error. Oh, that's cool. Oh, no such bean of type web client available. Good, that's easy to fix. So I need to create the bean of type web client. Return web client dot and I could just create it myself like this, but it's much better instead to use the pre-built web client builder that comes with Spring Boot, and you just you just use that. Spring Boot can customize the builder and contribute, you know, things like OAuth authentication and client-side load balancing, and you can just take it the rest of the way. You can add other things to it if you wanted to to further customize it, but most of the time you're just going to say, okay, I'll take the I'll take it from here. 
Now, restart. Okay, close this, get that. All right, so there we are, uh, this minus V. Wah. Okay, so there's our names, okay? That worked just fine. There's all the data that comes back from the endpoint. It's a very simple example, but it does demonstrate some very simple concepts, right? We, get, we have a simple API adapter. Now, let's think about this. What happens if this fails here? Well, I could do uh, on error map, or on error resume. So here I'm saying, when an exception is thrown, give me a chance to process the exception and then return a fallback value. So I can say, eek, right? And this, it looks very verbose, but it's actually a very clean thing to write as a lambda, like that. So let's see what that looks like. Now, do you have, you know, what was it you were telling me about earlier? Perel, per, per, uh, what's the holiday? It's kind of like Halloween. What is it? Purim. Purim, okay. In, in further west, we have something called Halloween, which is kind of a scary thing, right? I guess it's not, I guess Purim is not scary, but like in the west, we, further west, we have like, a, like, you know, ghosts and vampires and all these crazy things. And the, the goal is to scare people. So here's one of my, here's one of my favorite scary tricks for if you ever come to celebrate Halloween. You ready? No. Boo! <laughs> uh -huh. So I killed the service. Oh, that makes me so sad. And when I make the service call, I get eek, right? I didn't get a 500 error. I didn't get an exception. I got the result that I wanted. I degraded gracefully. I didn't build a system that was built on the lie that everything will be highly available all the time. Instead, I built software that fails in the way that I want, in the way that I can control. So now, this is one way to do it. Another might be just to do a retry. I could say, okay, I want to retry, you know, try the, retry the request. If it fails once, Retry, retry it again and fails again, retry it one more time, right? That's very simple. I could also say, I want to do a retry back off where I can say retry, uh, you know, after one second and then retry again after one, you know, keep, get, take more and more time. So the first time it'll be one second, the second time it'll be a little bit more than that and so on, going up until a minute, okay? So I have exponential back off here, right? So these operators are built into the reactive API. Um, now, Let's say that for now, let's ignore this all for now. Let's just say I wanted to make a call to another web service. Let's say that I want to call uh, two different web services and I want to get the results that come back. Okay, so flux of string, strings equals null, to do, flux of boolean, bools equals to do. Okay, so who cares where these come from? I don't, I don't know. Let's say that I've got a reactive web client call to this service and to this service. Okay, what I want to do is I want to take the streams of values and join them together. So if I get one from the left, I get one from the right, I create a new stream out of the values from both. Okay, so it's very common scatter, gather, service orchestration, right, kind of stuff. So here I can say flux.zip strings and bools map. And what I'm given is a tuple, t1 and t2. Right? It's showing me one from each. It's like a zipper. I take one from the left, one from the right, one from the left, one from the right, one from the left, one from the right. Like a zipper, right? Interlocking. So each time there's one value on the left, and each time there's one value on the right, it creates a new value in this new stream, which is the, the thing that we have here. Right? So var c equals the, the result of that. Okay? Um, so that's very easy to do. Because remember, at this point, Assuming you have valid publishers that are in you know, a web client calls, nothing has happened here. It's inert. You have to subscribe for it to actually send bytes over the network. Nothing has been sent over the network so far. Now, what if, um, what if I'm in an, an SLA-driven environment? Right? SLAs are, uh, they mean that you can, if I have an SLA-driven environment, I don't want to call uh, a downstream service and then have it return a value after my SLA. If I'm responsible for an SLA for my client, I cannot afford to wait for the response to come from the downstream service. And so what high-performing organizations like Google, Netflix, and Uber do is something called hedging. Hedging, right? Hedging. Hedging is, it means that uh, you're hedging your bet, right? Instead of putting all your money in one basket, in one stock, or in one you know, bet on the gambling table, instead of doing 
all of it in one thing that has very high risk. You put a little bit of money here, a little bit of money here, a little bit of money here. So you maybe you lose here, but so what? You hedged your bet and these other, one, these other two might still win, okay? Same thing in a high performance service environment. Maybe I wanna call another service, but that service is for whatever reason slow, right? They should be using Azul, obviously, but they're not, right? And so the service is slow. Maybe it's doing a garbage collection pause. Maybe it's out to lunch. Maybe it's just down. Maybe it's in PHP and so it's trash, right? Whatever the reason, whatever the reason that service isn't responding in time, you cannot afford to wait for that response to come back. And so what you do is you call one of the other instances of the same service. If you have a service registry with Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud, very, it's very easy using uh, the discovery client, DC, right? It's very easy to say, give me, you know, for all of the service types, for all the instances uh, of the service called Foo service, I want to visit each one of those service instances and I can get the host and the port, right? So that, that creates a, a stream of URIs, right? So now I've got all the URIs and I can actually say, oh, I want to just take, uh, you know, some number, right? I can take some, uh, uh, whatever, skip, whatever. I can take just one or two or whatever. So here I've got all the different URIs for the same service. So maybe I want to read data for, and I've got the data on three different services. They're all the same service, but they're on three different hosts and ports. One of them might be slow. It might be garbage collecting. It might be do it, doing whatever. Okay, but not all of them. They can't all be down. And so with service hedging, what you're doing is you're, is you're saying, get three different distinct host and ports, and then call all three of them at the same time concurrently. Whichever one starts to respond first, you keep the results from that one and you throw away the results from everything else. This is complicated code to write if you're doing fork join pools and cyclic barriers and countdown latches and all that good stuff. But it's very easy code to write with reactive APIs. So let's say, you know, flux of string uh, A, B, and C, okay? So now I've got the same, let's say that these are all, you know, I'm, I'm, I have calls to the same services uh, and I have three different references here. Now I can say flux.first A.BC. This gives me the first stream to return values. It'll also cancel using back pressure the other two, okay? So now it's the same service. I'm making the same call three different times and I'm getting the results from one of them just in time. Now, you should use this trick only on services that are idempotent, obviously. You shouldn't charge the customer's credit card three times, right? That's not gonna be a good idea. But for read operations where it's the same result no matter who serves it up, this is a great pattern. So these are all very easy things to express using reactive APIs. Now then, we are at a, um, a pretty good place. I do, I, I wanted to show you uh, just one or two more things here. So we're gonna go very quick. We've looked at a, a number of things here. All of the things that we looked at here so far are GA. You can use this in production. I wanted to look at two more things that are kind of not GA yet, that are interesting and that you should consider looking at and I hope you will look at, but that aren't ready for production yet. Think, of, think about them kind of like PHP. They shouldn't be anywhere near production, right? Nowhere near production. Here's production. Here's PHP, never the two shall meet, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my service and I've got this application which is storing data in the database using reactive MongoDB. Now, I like MongoDB, but let's be honest, it's not the only database out there and I think that most of us, if we are honest, are still predominantly using SQL databases. I like SQL databases too, so what I wanna do is I wanna use a brand new project called R2DBC. Here's R2DBC that we created that's designed to support reactive, uh, uh, IO, reactive uh, database drivers where they are available. Right now it's a limited choice, right? We have limited options. One is for Postgres, one is for Microsoft SQL Server, and one is for H2. So it's an abstraction that supports natively asynchronous database drivers. I'm gonna add this to my, uh, my application manually, right? There's no, there's no Spring Boot auto configuration. There's no out of the box uh, dependencies or starters. So I have to do this work myself like this. Uh, you add the repositories like so, uh, we've got it. And you add the R2DBC Postgres and, R and Spring Data R2DBC. I've commented out MongoDB here. And so I have to go to my code. I have to get rid of that. I have to change this into an, a monotonically incrementing in integer. 
and change this to represent that fact. And in the future, this should be all that you need to do. But because it's not yet completely integrated with Spring Boot, we need to create the configuration to tell our application where to find Postgres manually. R2DBC config extends abstract R2DBC configuration. And there you go, at configuration, at enable R2DBC repositories, okay? So here, I'm gonna return a new Postgres connection factory. And here, I'm gonna require some configuration. Now, in the future, it is my hope that just like with JDBC today, JDBC is a blocking API, by the way, so we can't use that. But in the future, I hope that we can just specify in our property file for Spring Boot, spring.datasource.url, something like that, and it'll turn into a connection fit configuration uh, for our application. So, dot username is gonna be orders, dot host is localhost, and of course, I should keep all of this in a property file, but YOLO, okay, so here we go and uh, database name, orders, okay? So now, before I do this, we should confirm Mongo, this is what I had before, right? Mongo db dot reservation dot find, right? There's MongoDB, you can see our names, etc. all of us here. And if I go to Postgres, p sql, u orders, orders, uh, delete, from reservation, good. Now let's restart this application. Okay, there we are, all eight of us. So, you know, there's hope in the future. I hope that this will become a more interesting option for all of us. My friends, I hope you got something out of this. I hope you learned something. I hope you saw something new. I am a big fan of all this stuff. I hope you are interested in some of what you saw here. I think that there's a bright and wonderful future to be had here. We looked today at reactive, uh, we looked at reactor, we looked at building reactive pipelines, we looked at the need for uh, an API that makes working with asynchronous IO more palatable. We looked at um, uh, reactive NoSQL and SQL persistence. We looked at building reactive web endpoints. Oh. Uh, we, looked at, uh, we looked at building applications uh, that are edge services. We looked at Spring Cloud Gateway and API gateways and API adapters. We looked at uh, patterns for service orchestration and discovery, composition, uh, uh, you know, scatter gather kind of assembly of endpoints. We looked at, uh, uh, what else did we look at? Reliability patterns like hedging and, and, and so on. I didn't get to show circuit breakers. We looked at these operators that support more robust code. Uh, and we also looked at um, uh, uh, R2DBC, which I said. There's one other thing I would have liked to have shown you, which is uh, RSocket, which is a protocol that was developed by Facebook that is natively reactive, for which Spring Boot has, uh, uh, Spring Framework 5.2 coming this year has built-in support, and uh, you can use, it's, built, it's based on Reactor. So if you're using Facebook, and I don't know why you would, but if you are using Facebook, you're using Reactor at scale, right? And they're not the only ones, right? There's a lot of different companies out there that are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Reactor uh, at, at scale. So Netflix uh, and, uh, and uh, Alibaba and Baidu and uh, eBay and a whole bunch of other organizations that are all huge scale that, are, uh, that have the need, the mo motivation and the, the, uh, the, the, the benefit of needing to solve this problem. They need to solve, they need to be able to build better software faster and they choose, uh, despite all these other options, they choose to build on the Pivotal stack because it, at the end of the day, it allows them to build better software faster and that is ultimately all that matters. Thank you so much, my friends. I hope you got something. <laughs>